And he looked over at me and I'm two sheets to the wind and it's probably one o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm like, got all these drinks vessels that are the size of me. And he was like, now see, she knows how to have a good time. Oh, and I was man. just like, you know, I was just like, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't have a shut off. And if I can blame that on ADHD, all the better. Cause then it doesn't make it about me. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Amy Liz Harrison's podcast, Eternally Amy, a mum of eight's journey from jail to joy. A Gen Xer who overcame her struggle with alcohol to become a best-selling author and mental health advocate. She shares stories of hope and offers ideas for others struggling with mental health challenges, spirituality, ADHD, or maybe just family, travel, and logistics. One thing is for sure, you'll leave with something to chew on. And now, here's your host, Amy Liz Harrison with your mystery meat sandwich. Greetings, compadres. So guess what? We're not doing a mystery meat sandwich today because who needs it? Like it's the boozeless book club and we just there needs to be no introduction or anything like that. So we have Carolyn Bunn today. We have Sarah Alamo and we have Elise Bryson. And here's the thing. They all have great things that they're doing. Like Carolyn is my social media manager, my business lady slash guru. Sarah is a career happiness coach and an author. And Elise, you're a VP now, correct? I am a VP of community development. Mm -hmm. I love that. And she works for Intentional Sidekick. And... Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, these ladies, I just, I have to say, I don't really care what we read. We could be reading a bot magazine and I would read it with you guys because we always have a lot of fun. And so um, thanks for being part of the Boozeless Book Club, Boozeless Book Club Fades. So what I'd like to do is turn it over to Carolyn to read the blurb of the your brain's not broken book that we read for October. So I hope I have the name of this author right, if she's listening, um, Tamara Rosier. The book today that I'm reading the back cover is Lose the Shame, Love Your Brain, and Live Better with ADHD. If you have ADHD, your brain doesn't work the same way as a normal, quote, or neurotypical brain does because it's wired differently. This difference in circuitry is not somehow wrong and complete or shameful. However, it does present you with significant challenges like time management, organizational skills, forgetfulness, trouble completing tasks, mood swings, and relationship problems. In Your Brain's Not Broken, Tamara applies her years of coaching others to explain how ADHD affects every aspect of your life so that you can finally understand why you think, feel, and act the way you do. The result, practical tools that can dramatically improve your personal and professional life. So um, here's the deal, guys. So this book for me um, was validating, I'm going to say, because... um, you know, it's October. Among many other things, the list is long. ADHD is one of the awareness topics for the month of October. And if you are comfortable sharing, is there anybody else in the room who has been diagnosed with any kind of a mental health uh, challenge? And are you comfortable saying if you have ADHD? And if you're not, you can say, Pass. (laughs) Pass. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah and I have ADHD. <laughs> and it's something that I was diagnosed with as an adult. I had no idea. Um, I, it's probably something I was, you know, working on masking my entire life. And I would say in early recovery, um, you know, when it really started rearing its ugly head, I tried to mask it with drinking all the caffeine in the land to try to feel normal and get things done. Um, so I agree with the, the validating part. Um, when I finally had that diagnosis, I finally understood one of those things that was wrong with me. <laughs> yeah. 
my name is Elise, and I was diagnosed with ADHD in July of this year, 2022. I only went in and got a diagnosis because my sister was diagnosed last December. And when she was talking to me about her, uh, the process she went through and how eye opening it was, I was like, wow, I know we have a lot of things in common. And especially, I mean, not just the way that we obviously grew up in the same environment, but um, our brain works in similar ways. We're very different in many ways. Uh, but so that's that's what prompted me to go in. And I, so yes, um, I don't, uh, the only thing I have changed really in my life after getting this information is I do take a supplement now from Costco called Focus Factor. This mm. podcast is not sponsored by Focus <laughs> Factor, but it should be. Um, and I actually find when I take that, it does help me focus. I love it. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I should try that. Um, Carolyn and I have not been diagnosed, um, mainly just because I haven't gone in and done that whole process, but I can relate to a lot of the things in this book and a lot of the, um, kind of, uh, tendencies that are, you know, come from having ADHD in terms of, lack of attentiveness or just different ways of being organized. I tend to focus a lot on one specific thing for a long time and kind of have trouble like jumping around. So I can definitely relate to a lot of these things. I'm going to say I'm probably self-diagnosed with ADHD and I'm going to probably go try <laughs> the supplement that you mentioned, Elise. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that sounds like a good one. And anything from Costco, like I'm in, you know, I mean, I mean, um, Right. And I will say it doesn't, um, I don't feel any, uh, as someone who has to really pay attention to taking anything that makes my body feel different, right? Because I, that's what I like. <laughs> and when I find something I like, I like it a lot. Um, I don't, it doesn't make me jittery. It doesn't make me feel up or anything like that. I do just, uh, notice that it gives me not that I struggle with focus, uh, similar to what Carolyn said, like I can get too focused and like be so like blinders on that, like a train could come through the back of my office here. And I would have no idea because I, and I lose hours at a time because just being so in a zone. But um, I do find that the focus factor just kind of helps me as I'm managing a lot of tasks on a day-to-day -day basis, just, you know, be able to check things off my to-do list. Yeah. No, totally. I can totally identify with that too. The hyper focus, I totally have that same thing. And, you know, I find that for me, it was kind of similar to when I, you know, found out I was an alcoholic slash admitted to my innermost self that I was an alcoholic because, um, it, you know, I suddenly didn't feel like it was my fault. You know, I mean, looking back at all the you know, school things that had happened like over the years and just feeling dumb and all of that stuff. It just, and I unpack it more in eternally awkward, but basically when I didn't feel like responsible for the way that my brain naturally was, I mean, I did a lot of what they call like masking, right? Trying my best to kind of do like a a show pony kind of like shuffle ball change and make it look like, you know, I didn't have it so that, I mean, I, and I didn't know that that's what it was anyway, but so that I didn't feel dumb compared to everybody else. I was kind of like, I don't get it over here. So let me just kind of, you know, do something to distract everybody else that I don't know what I'm doing, you know, and uh, specifically for me, it was like, it started in math class. And then it kind of went from there. If you miss some math concepts, you're kind of screwed if you don't get help, right? And so I related to that a lot. And then later when I was diagnosed in my 40 somethings, um, you know, my psychiatrist was like, well, finally, like I've been waiting for you to, you know, say you would get tested. And so thank you. And um it wasn't as bad as I thought because it felt like it made sense. So did you guys have any emotional sort of reactions to the book? Did it invoke anything in you? Um, or did you kind of feel like 
I mean, I guess, how did you feel about reading a book that talked about ADHD? Was it validating? What I'll say about that, sorry, it's a little loud behind me with Jack here, um, you love it. <laughs> um, is I had been medicated ever since I got diagnosed. I believe it was the beginning of 2019. So I've um, both taken Adderall and Vyvanse, which is like a slow release. Um, and you know, that's something I am a person in recovery and, you know, that is kind of a scary thing to take, you know, a controlled substance. Um, but it helped and I've always taken it as prescribed. Um, but when I found out I was pregnant, I stopped taking it just because they didn't have any sort of, um, proof that nothing could happen to the baby because no one had really tested it. So I just decided that was a good precaution to take and decided that I would take crazy pregnant brain along with untreated ADHD brain. And so it's been a really kind of rocky year. Um, and I, as you know, this is the topic, reading through the book, um, I decided to reach back out to um, my therapist to talk about being medicated again, um, just because I know I'm able to show up as my best self. So I know right now I'm tired and still have kind of a crazy new mom brain, but I decided that it was time to get medicated again. And that's my best way of managing it right now. Um, and, you know, utilizing tools like mentioned in the book is, is helpful. But right now I decided for me, I needed to be medicated. I think it helped um, me kind of understand some of my tendencies better. I liked the, I can't remember exactly which page it was on. I think 117, where she talks about how her daughter felt like she was in the island of the misfit toys. And mm -hmm. I often felt like that, um, especially I think for me, um, as an adult working in a corporate role where um, I would have managers saying, oh, you're dropping the ball on this. You're not doing things right. And I felt like, why am I different from everybody else? Um, and the truth is that I probably wasn't different from everybody else. Everybody else probably just hit it really well. Or, um, you know, if they did operate differently from me. And I think the thing about myself as well is that you know, once you start feeling like, and I'm sure all of you can probably relate to this. Once you start feeling like you are dropping the ball on something and something is starting to slip, whether it's those math problems or if it's something that happened to you in a job or whatever, um, the more and more you start to go down that slippery slope of, I don't remember things and people getting upset with you, uh, the harder it is to come back from that because you feel like you already have set yourself up for failure, your failure. You feel like you're already going to fail at this. And so you have that mindset already. So it definitely helped me kind of understand, you know, some of those pieces of myself that I see. What do you think, Elise? Nothing. That's Squirrel. Okay. No, just kidding. Yeah. Uh, no, that was, that was a dramatic pause on purpose. Um, I was trying to act like I was being very ADHD in the moment. I, you know, I have all the classic, classic things. I think it's really interesting. And I think Amy, you and I have talked about this before, how uh, those of us that grew up as kids and teens in the eighties and the nineties, like boys were being diagnosed with ADHD, but girls weren't right. Mm -hmm. Because it shows up looking a little bit different for us than it does for them. And I, I, I could be stating that completely wrong. This has just been my own personal experience. I'm definitely not trained uh, in any of these areas. Um, but yeah, I just assumed I had a very stereotypical uh, definition of ADHD up until my sister got diagnosed and I got to meet all of you and and you're so open talking about it and you have been since I met you and so it's definitely in the last year I've gotten a new perspective on it and uh it definitely makes a lot of sense for me um I mean and of course I love that I have something now I can blame my forgetfulness on um outside of I mean especially if I'm like I have ADHD and long COVID and I've had COVID twice, like, you know, because I just really want to make excuses when I forget shit, but it does, um, you know, in the last six months, I've, um, basically flipped my life upside down between buying a house and moving to a city. I don't know very well. Um, and leaving the media landscape after being in media sales sales for 25 years 
Um, and being in a completely different environment, working at a shipping company and working on some startups. And what's been coming up for me in the last uh, couple of months is I used to actually think I was a pretty organized person. And now that I've, I don't have deadlines and I don't have a direct way of measuring my success because before my success was, was I selling enough revenue to hit my goals. I was constantly measuring myself with either percentage to goal or meet exceed expectations, right? I had a scorecard. And right now I don't have a scorecard. I don't have a way Mm. to measure my success and I don't have any deadlines. So I have found that I have been spiraling the drain a little bit. um, And that's actually been really challenging for me to not have a very black and white measure of success because, you know, even during the pandemic, if I wasn't hitting my quarterly revenue goals when I was at the TV station, I could tell you exactly where I was going to end and I could tell you exactly why I wasn't going to hit. And then I could tell you exactly what my plan was for the following quarter to bring it back. Right. And now that I've changed the kind of work that I do, um, I feel a really uncomfortable, right? And I'm really struggling with how do I organize my day when nothing is a 911 and nothing is on a deadline. It's really bizarre. And and my new boss would say that um, drama is completely unnecessary. And if there is drama, it means bad management or bad leadership, right? And so I'm like, oh, that makes, that actually... Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And quite honestly, like there shouldn't have been drama in in my media life either. Like I wasn't saving lives, right? I can understand when you're a nurse and you work in an ER, like that drama, 100%. There's a reason that shows like Grey's Anatomy and Nurse Jackie exist, right? But in my life, drama, there, it's only it's only been kind of self-created. It, you know, and so I just find that I'm really flailing and trying to figure out what my new normal is. And then, oh, by the way, you layer in, we're just coming out of a pandemic. And now it's like, I want to go and do things, but I don't want to do everything. And now I've got a little bit longer commute. And so I can't even wrap my brain around the fact that I am no longer 10 minutes from Bellevue or 10 minutes from Seattle. And I'm still like, I know that I live like 30 plus minutes out of Seattle now. But I'm not, yesterday was a perfect example of, I know this, it's been for two months now, and I still didn't leave on time to get to downtown Seattle. I didn't allow for enough traffic in. And like, I sh- like I should know better, but I'm not, I'm just not, I'm just really having a hard time getting organized in whatever mm-hmm. this new normal is going to look like. Well, and I love that because don't you think that, um, or at least for me, I'll speak for myself. Anytime there's anything new in my life, I I like, I freak out. It's like, I kind of get this weird, like robot kind of like springs or like coming out of my brain or something. Like I'm just kind of like overloaded because I can't figure out like, well, what's going to be my new system of doing things and how do I do that? I mean, it's totally, you know, being an author, it was big, big deal for me in that because nobody was telling me how to do it. And then I'd go on, you know, line or talk to people and everybody had different opinions and, you know, you should do this, you shouldn't do that. And, you know, this is the way to blah, blah, blah. And, um, I'm still finding my way, you know, it's definitely not like the journey is over, but, um, for something that I am brand new at and I don't know well at all, I need like the four dummies book. You know what I mean? Like I need step-by-step instructions because I don't have the, you know, kind of freelance sort of like, whatever, I'll wing it. I can't do that when I, when I'm brand new at something and I have no idea what's going on. Like I just, I struggle with that a lot. Well, and you know, I'm going to go a, a little bit off topic, but not not really. Like I'll, I'll I'll try to land the plane back around. Three of the four of us right now are are intentionally going through a nine week training, right, where we're looking mm-hmm. at a lot of different things with how we bring intention into our everyday life. And this week we talked about the four levels of energy, 
-hmm. and that it's not actually about managing the time because time is just time. You can't buy more, you can't get more, right? And yes, of course, time management matters. But this week we talked a lot about how the energy that you bring to a situation matters a lot more than the time. The time is just like a measurable constraint, but aligning my energy to match the activity that I'm doing and that whether it's high stress or good stress, right? Yeah, both, both are necessary. You can't not have stress in your life. You know, that's what makes everything good or bad. So it, it, it just is, but then planning enough downtime recovery time after I need to be in a high energy situation. So a high energy situation could be being around a lot of people or talking in front of a group or going somewhere, a part of town that I haven't been to ever or in not in a long time and everything feels different. Like just learning to like plan that downtime. Um, I'm really kind of, it's kind of just, I'm kind of like, wow, I've been doing like, I've been doing it all backwards. Yeah. I mean, yeah. honestly, cause I just listened to it today, um, this morning and was blown away by the whole concept of the recovery time in that. I think I kind of thought I was doing that. I think I kind of thought that I was planning recovery time in, but it's not like 15 minutes between meetings. And I think sometimes I still, you know, cause I could take 15 minutes and make great use of it, or I could jump on my phone and waste it and, you know, doing other things. And so, um, yeah, I loved, I loved the whole concept of the energy. And I think, you know, that is one thing that my ADHD has, has shown me is like, when I have this hamster wheel brain, I, I mean, I got to have that meditation in place where I turn it off, you know, um, because it's not going to function well. Um, if I don't, it's going to make up all kinds of crazy narratives. And, you know, like I'm kind of a big book junkie, right? And it always says, you know, we won't waste, burn up so much energy like we were doing, you know, when we were drinking and making up all these stories in our head. Well, and I think, and I want to hear from Carolyn and, and Sarah, if you agree with this, but I think as women with, we're all business women, we all have a growth mindset. We, we all have pretty classy problems in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I sometimes, I have always looked at downtime or relaxation time as being lazy. Mm -hmm. It's my lazy time. And I make that a negative thing, right? When the way that I was rethinking things this week is no, it's not lazy. I have to be intentional about that down, that recharging time, right? I mean, if you have a Tesla, you have to charge it in a certain amount of times to make sure that it runs, right? It's like when I moved in to this house, the refrigerator that they left out in the garage wasn't working. And I was like, what the fuck? They left me a refrigerator that doesn't work. Now I'm going to have to haul it away. Ugh. And my son was like, did you check and see if it was plugged in? right? Like really simple stuff. And it's like, so I'm just saying that sometimes I think our ADHD brains are just like, ah, la, 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 la. and we think that if we take down time, we're somehow being wasteful or lazy, or it's not a good use of our time. But actually we do have to plan that downtime mm -hmm. and it has to be more than 15 minutes in between meetings. And mm -hmm. if we decide to, to use that downtime, going down a TikTok rabbit hole, we don't have to shame ourselves for that either. If that's a form of entertainment that helps us just kind of like unplug and not be on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think that's um, one thing that I definitely struggle with. And I think I especially struggle with it now that I am on my own, right? Like I'm not depending um, on a salary. I don't have like a weekly set salary. So for me, if I'm not working, I feel like I'm not going to be making money. And it's taken me a long time to get to the point where I'm like, I'm, I'm going to be okay. You know, I, I don't have to be working all the time. Um, and so one of the things that you guys know, and maybe the other people listening don't know is that, um, my partner and I, we travel quite a bit. And so we just got back from, um, two weeks in Australia. And then recently I was just telling Amy, we went on a little short um, van camping trip the last few days, which is really fun. But one of the things that I notice about myself is that I really struggle 
to um, get into the vacation mode the first couple of days. Like it can honestly take me a couple of days. And I felt really guilty because this van trip that uh, my boyfriend had planned, um, it was only like three days long. And so I'm spending the first day kind of like, okay, I have to be doing this thing. And I'm feeling really restless because I'm not in that vacation mode. And I just needed to like unplug and kind of be in the moment because if you're not, that moment will pass. And then you kind of didn't take that time to recharge. So I totally agree with what you're saying. I'm still working on getting into that (laughs) recharge (laughs) mindset. So good. Yeah, true. Can't totally relatable. And then Sarah, as a new mom, how are you navigating all this? It's definitely been um, a big mindset change because I do feel lazy because I do spend a lot of my time sitting around. Do you guys want to talk about any show that's on Netflix or Hulu or Prime? Because I've seen all of them in the last, (laughs) it's ridiculous how much TV I watch these days, but I spend so much of my time. I mean, currently I'm feeding my son right now. I don't know why feeding a child seems like a waste of time, but because I do spend a lot of my time sitting around, I don't have my own time. My, my luxury time right now is unloading the dishwasher or cleaning the toilet before someone comes to visit. Um, and that's just something I've had to get used to over the last three months. This is a season. It's not forever. Um, I'm not lazy. Um, and that's been a really hard thing to work through. But, um, you know, I think my husband recognizes that and understands, you know, I've left him with the kid for about an hour here and there. So he fully understands and is supportive of that. Um, but yeah, that's just definitely been a hard thing to come to terms with because before he was born, I was working and, you know, always out and about with people and keeping our home in order and those sorts of things. I'm very type A OCD. And the fact that there's stuff on the counter right now bugs me, but I'm okay. I'm getting better with it. <laughs> I totally know what you mean, Sarah, about the season thing. And I think that's something that I'm trying to get better with as well is just recognizing that there will be seasons of maybe months at a time where I'm not going to have the same level of productivity that I did um, a few months ago. And that's okay. And kind of like preparing myself to get back up into that place. But everybody has seasons in their life, right? And we don't always have to be operating at 110% to be successful people. Well, and that's the sad thing is that's kind of the message that we get, at least in our country. Um, you know, as I've looked into um, different companies to join or different companies policies, I see that, you know, vacation time and maternity leave, those kind of things are so varying. But what I did want to touch on, because a few people mentioned work, is that um, this is finally a part of the conversation that companies are finally starting to recognize neurodiversity and recognizing um, that people have different ways of working. You know, Carolyn was talking about being, you know, judged against others who work differently. And I don't know if any of you guys have any experiences where you have a positive experience with neurodiversity being recognized, but um, I love that we're having this conversation today and that it's something that is actually being acknowledged now so that maybe moving forward, people won't feel so lazy or not on top of their game. Well, I love that you brought that up because um, even though I don't have like a conventional job, like, you know, even with some of the different stuff I'm involved in, you know, people want to send me a spreadsheet and I'm like, oh no, like I'm out kind of thing. For me, uh, how my brain works and operates is Like I got to have a whiteboard and I got to like whiteboard it out and, or I also have to have, like, I have so many bins, you guys, I have cabinets in my garage full of bins. I've like the football bin and that's got, you know, the cooler and the noisemakers and all the stuff in it. But I, it's like, I'm more tactile and visual, but give me a spreadsheet. And I'm like instantly like, ah and I'm terrified and I don't know where to start and somebody has to translate it to me. So, um, and I think for me, I've felt some shame around that. Like there's, you know, well, I'm just, you know, and I kind of get all Eeyore about it. 
you know, I haven't been in a workplace for over 20 years and, uh, you know, and it's like, I just do things differently. It's okay. I would just say that uh, the older that I get, the more I'm just like, you know what, this is the way that I'm going to do this thing. And this works yeah. for me and that doesn't work for me. If you don't like it, I don't really care. Yeah. Um, instead of, I remember like, I, I also, Amy can't stand spreadsheets. I really don't like them. I mean, I've learned to tolerate them and like work with them, but I remember early in my career, I was like, oh, okay, I guess I have to learn spreadsheets in order to be successful. And just realizing that everybody has different gifts. Mm -hmm. Numbers are not my gift. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that I actually kind of realized is that um, like Prosh, my partner and I, we, we both recently got our, um, went through school and completed our MBAs in the same program. I got mine in marketing. I love, love marketing. I love the psychology around it. I love how to be creative. He hates it. He absolutely just, I don't get it. I don't understand it, um, but he's great with numbers. And so it was just like a real lesson in terms of everybody has different gifts and it's okay to recognize what your gifts are and to help um, kind of balance out the other people or teach the other people who might not understand what your gift is. And maybe they can help you if like, you're not a numbers person, for example. So, yeah. So Elise, this is kind of switching gears and off topic, but maybe not. Is there like a 30th birthday party story that might have invoked some emotions in you or? <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we were texting back and forth uh, last night about uh, Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how I'm going to tie this back around to ADHD, but That's uh, okay. I can definitely tie it back to my alcoholism. So when I was... 30, I decided it would be super fun to go to Vegas with like nine of my best friends at the time. I don't know that I've ever traveled with that many women since then. It was, I, well, that's not true. I've been to women's retreats in sobriety, but that's not like traveling to another city where people are focused on booze. So I was still very much drinking. This is actually maybe less than a year before I got sober. My birthday's in July, so it was very hot. There were nine of us. And I think we were crowded into like two hotel rooms because, you know, we're just girls on a budget wanting to blow it all on partying. And um, and we went to old Las Vegas to Fremont and it was really hot out. So we just wanted to go anywhere. There was air conditioning. And of the nine of us at the time, one gal was identifying as bisexual. And so she really wanted to go into a lady strip club. And I was like, I don't care as long as it's air conditioned. Like, I don't like I was already two sheets to the wind. So I don't care. And this is uh, this is before social media. Thank God. God, I Thank just God. want to say um, that is the best thing that ever happened to me was getting sober when social media started because I was a drunk dialer. And so if I had been drinking when I was on social media, nobody would, would have wanted to be friends with me. And I would be very embarrassed on a regular basis by the memories that come up from 15 years ago now. <laughs> um, anywho, I digress. So we end up in this lady strip club. It was a two drink minimum. Fine. I mean, I can drink two drinks in five minutes, so I have mm -hmm. no problem with the minimum, right? What's the maximum is what I want to know. <laughs> and um, anyway, all I remember is that the gal who was identifying as bisexual really wanted to go into the back and get a lap dance. And and for whatever reason, the way I understood it was if I if I spent 20 bucks, we were if we each spent 20 bucks, we could all go into this back room and this girl could get what she wanted. That's how we thought, we all thought we understood how this was going to play out. Now, keep in mind, nobody was sober, right? <laughs> I'm not saying that all nine of us were alcoholics, definitely not, but I don't think I was the only one. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, so, but what actually happened is they ended up bringing multiple dancers into the back and we each had to spend $20 for each performer. And oh. they brought back like six. So we each ended up having to spend, what is the math on that? $120. Well, times nine, we spent over a grand on female strippers in Vegas. Oh gosh. And only one person was identifying as wanting that. And <laughs> um, 
And so thank goodness social media didn't exist. I don't remember a lot of details. I remember being entertained and laughing really hard. I do. And screaming a lot. I do remember that. Um, but yeah, that time that we blew like $1,500 on female strippers was really something. And that trip, we also ended up, um, that's where we went to the clubs and you bought the, I don't know what size they call the super, it's bigger than a gallon of vodka. It's whatever the next size up. It's like super big. And it was like, and we ordered like three of those and they were like $1,500 a piece. And like, literally the nine of us went through three of them. Now I'm sure we were sharing with whoever, right. But yeah, that impulse control has always been an issue for me. And the uh, ability to make good decisions in the moment is, uh, was really a struggle for me before getting sober. And I haven't, I haven't completely nailed it yet, but. Well, that is, that is actually, that is the perfect example of impulse control. And one quick question I have is, did the drinks have a neck strap? Oh, okay. I, same trip. Okay. Remember the big drinks that were like as tall as I am. I'm only five, four. So you yes. know, those drinks that are as tall as, as you are, but with the neck strap. Yes. So I had one of those. Uh, and then do you remember the, the, what the drinks that are like the oversized ginormous, like martini glasses? Yeah. So my friend, my two of my friends each had one of those and we were shopping and I, I want to say we were at the Venetian shopping. I don't know where we were. It doesn't matter. But they went into whatever store. And for whatever reason, that store would not let you bring beverages in. So I was sitting outside with my next step drink and then <laughs> holding the two martini glasses. I do kind of wish that there was video footage of this because, I mean, that would have I would really be able to rock that now um, as of my before picture. But this couple walked by and they were they were arguing right? They were, I don't know about what, but they were definitely arguing. And he looked over at me and I'm two sheets to the wind and it's probably one o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm like, got all these drinks vessels that are the size of me. And he was like, now see, she knows how to have a good time. Oh, and I was man. just like, you know, I was just like, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't have a shut off. And if I can blame that on ADHD, all the better. Cause then it doesn't make it about me. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Gosh, I wish you had a picture of that. <laughs> I really, I mean, I guess I could kind of, we, re, we could recreate it, Amy. Let's we go could, we could go to Vegas and when we see dr girls that have those things, we could be like, can we just borrow your drink for a photo op? Just you know? for a picture. Yeah. I'll, I'll get yeah. one and fill it with Diet Coke. That makes me happy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually, the tall one with the neck strap, I brought mine back on the plane because I was like, I'm going to use this cup at, at, at backyard parties. Right. And then yeah. I had the, bl the blinky ice cubes that you could put in that would like <laughs> make the whole drink, you know, and pe my friends referred to me as Bob blackout Bryson, which I wore like a badge of honor. Right. Yeah. Why did we think that drinking made us so sexy? It I don't know. I, did, I didn't keep a lot of pictures when I got my first DUI. I just like went through and deleted everything. Cause I thought that was going to save me from going to jail. <laughs> did you, did you have like a real mug shot? No, unfortunately. Darn. What? Darn. No. <laughs> Does anybody here have a real mug shot? I kind of, I don't, I should, I but do. I don't. You but do? unfortunately I couldn't find it. So when I was mm -hmm. putting my book out, I wanted to put it in there. And I guess King County is like, you know what? We got too many. It's been too long. Like I couldn't find it. And I mean, I went through all the channels and I'm bummed. Do you have one? I don't have one, but I would, uh, my passport picture looks like a mugshot, so it could qualify. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Right. Well, one funny thing that my psychiatrist did say to me, and I don't mean ha ha funny, but just interesting funny is that he said, well, maybe you weren't really an alcoholic. Maybe you just had ADHD and that was your problem. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. so I had to politely say, you know, yeah, well, thanks. But no, I'm OK with having both. And, you know, it doesn't bother me. It actually helps me understand more about myself. And um, but yeah, it is interesting because I will come across those people from time to time. But I think the more we put these puzzle pieces together about ourselves more. It helps at least for me. 
Sarah, yeah. I, I have a question for you because you brought up the fact um, that you were at least taking Adderall prior to getting pregnant. In the church basement circles that we run in, there can be some real strong opinions uh, as re- as it relates to prescription medication that um, can be mood altering. Um, I myself am on antidepressants. Um, I have never, even after being diagnosed with ADHD, I have not opted to look at Adderall as an option only because I did used to have a cocaine problem. And so it just feels like it might be a little too triggering for me. And I've made it this far in life without needing the extra stimuli. So I'd love to hear if you've had like what your experience was around Adderall usage if it, if you found it triggering in any way, if people gave you shit for it, like what's your story there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so drugs are not a part of my story. I was a strictly booze girl. Um, so, you know, that kind of helps a little bit, I would imagine. Um, but I, the psychotherapist, is that the one that prescribes? I can't remember. Um, the guy that I see, he is in recovery. And so we, um, discussed everything at length. Um, and you know, it, it, it helped probably the only thing that became triggering. And I'll be honest here is I have struggled with disordered eating many, many times in my life. And there are definitely periods of my life where I was literally living off of diet pills. So that was kind of one of the side effects I felt from Adderall. I was like, Oh, I like this. Oh, Oh, cause you're not hungry. You're not hungry. Yeah. It kind of gives me some extra energy. I did switch over to Vyvanse, which is a um, slow release version of Adderall. So it kept me going throughout the day. Um, I just had to be super cognizant. I was working with a different sponsor at the time. So when that happened, I went ahead and, or, you know, when I started taking that medication, I went ahead and talked to her about it. It's not something I talk a lot about in the rooms because like you said, there is kind of that stigma but, you know, I think there's so many things that we can do to help ourselves. I go to meetings, I do steps, I take this medication, you know, I have been in therapy or counseling throughout recovery. I think it's just one of those things. You know, it's something that Amy and I discuss. She is my sponsor now, and it's something that she understands. So I know that it's something we can continue to talk about if it ever became a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my my husband wouldn't mind me mentioning, he too is ADHD. He was the one who recognized it in me. He did all the drugs, every drug that there is to the nth degree. And he is on these stimulants, but he takes them properly and he's able to function in life. So he hasn't gotten to a place where he needed to abuse them. We respect it. We talk about it. So I think just having that open communication and taking things properly as prescribed, which I know sometimes can even be a slippery slope, but I feel like because the gentleman who has prescribed these to us is a man in the program, he does a really good check-in every time we talk to him. Yeah. That's the funny thing about taking things as like following the directions. Who knew (laughs) that if you just follow the directions, the medication does exactly what it's supposed to do. Oh my gosh. So true. Um, how about you, Carolyn? Do you have anything to add about tools or medication or medication is a tool, right? So like any of those things um, in your tool belt? Yeah. So I currently don't take any medication. As I said, I'm not professionally prescribed, so that would make sense. Um, but for me, it's a lot of it is just around being organized mm-hmm. and um, being organized kind of helps me, um, you know, with everything else in my life as it does with most people. But, um, I'd say for me in terms of being organized, the biggest thing I do is just utilize my calendar. If it's not in my calendar, I will totally forget about it. And then I would also say something that also helps me as well is getting regular exercise. I, I definitely notice it when I'm not, able to get my regular workouts in my, everything else is kind of like starts falling apart in my daily life. Um, and so getting my serotonin through workouts rather than, um, you know, like I, I used to drink a lot. So, um, that definitely helps me as well. 
Um, just mm-hmm. kind of, I just know that about myself is being able to stay organized and having that, that daily dose of serotonin through some form of exercise, mm-hmm. which might sound different from a lot of people that have ADHD. I don't know, but that's just <laughs> the two things that I know about myself. Not at all. I think that's an amazing tool. That was something mm-hmm. that we were just talking about yesterday as we don't belong to any sort of gym any longer. And as we're heading into the winter months, we're talking about, you know, self-care and how to stay sane. Um, and so we're going to join a gym again for that exact reason. Get our serotonin drug. Yeah. I love it. Well, I do know that um, we should think about wrapping up because. Um, one of us has like a hard stop and you know what I wanted to do to kind of bring this back around was mention a part in the book that I really identified with, which was Tamara was, she was giving, I'm calling her Tamara, hashtag Tam. Anyways, she was um, using the example of a client she had that didn't want to get bogged down in like the businessy side of her business. She didn't want to like do the bills and uh, you know, she just wanted to just do the fun parts, right? I don't know nothing about that. I could not relate. Just kidding. Everything about that made sense to me. I could completely identify with that. And I think that, you know, I've had so many times in my life where I have, and this is like beyond the scope of, you know, a business or whatever, where I've, my brain is going so fast that I'll think that other people can read my mind. I'll be like, didn't I tell you this? Or didn't I Right. And so what was happening with Tamara's uh, client she was talking about is this client was not communicating to the person who was trying to do her bills, like anything about anything. And so the person is like, you know, hey, I need some, you know, direction. I need some passwords. I need, I'm trying to help you, you know, help me help you, the whole thing. And um, I related so strongly to that because. Yeah, I I will think that I have explained something well and I have not, right? And so um that was kind of an area of growth for me, but I also think it's an it's an important way to kind of put a little bow on this too is that you know, just what we're doing here even by way of this book which is communicating about ADHD and the struggles and challenges that it can produce and, you know, sharing tools and, you know, asking how do you manage this and how do you manage that and just trying to gain information and the more tools that we have in our toolbox, right? The better, like the better. And we never know too, at least for me, when I will randomly need something that I heard like a long time ago. And yet somehow I remember that, but I have no idea what I had for breakfast, you know, but these things, it's that whole, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. It's Mm -hmm. that whole concept of like, you know, it will show up when we need to show when we need it to show up, but we have to be talking and communicating and honoring each other's experiences um, to do this. So, and to be supportive of each other. So um, does anybody else have any final thoughts before I announce the book club for next month? It was a great conversation. Yeah. It was it was great to get to know, um, the, to talk more about the book, but also to understand more about your backgrounds with ADHD as well. Definitely. Finally, I- we ha- we found something we all have in common. Gosh, that took forever. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Common ground. (laughs) Yeah. Bottom line is it's just nice to know we're not alone, right? We're not alone. And we all go through these kind of ups and downs with um, some of our struggles that, you know, our mental health diagnosis is, but within that space, you know, we do, we have those ups, we have those downs, we have good days, we have bad days, but the more we communicate about it and, you know, kind of let down those guards, I mean, it has done nothing but just totally return, you know, twofold to me anyway. So um, thanks for letting me be a safe place to process because P.S. These girls are my friends in real life outside of podcast and I just love them. And 
uh, next month, you know, heading kind of into holiday season ish. I mean, Costco was already there, like in July. Already there. Mm-hmm. Already there. Already there. So the book for next month is by Kim Holderness. So if you've seen those funny spoof videos, I was going to say on TV, no, nay, on the interwebs. Her book is called Everybody Fights, colon, so why not get better at it? And <laughs> I just thought that was appropriate heading into the holidays. We might need a few pointers. I don't know. I mean, speaking for myself. So um, that's what it is, is everybody fights. So why not get better at it? So if you want to read along, order it or listen to it or do whatever you want to do with it. Thank you all so much, you babes, you boozeless babes. I love you guys so much. And be kind, rewind. Take what you like and leave the rest behind. Thank you so much for listening to Eternally Amy. Amy Liz Harrison is a best-selling author, speaker, 12-step coach, meditation teacher, and recovery advocate. To find out more, please visit amylizharrison.com. Keep up with Amy on all platforms by following at Amy Liz Harrison. Please subscribe and review this podcast. It means so much to us if you do.